morning, everyone. Please come on in. We're going to get started this morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. This is a very uh, joyful time of the year. Uh, we get to celebrate the, work of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this Sunday, we're actually going to be celebrating more than that, the actual reason why he was born here. We're going to celebrate his death, burial, and, resur and resurrection. But it is a joyful time of the year, so please stand. Join us in singing, Joyful, Joyful. Good to have you here on this uh, very, very nice December morning. Grateful for each and every one. There are many, many announcements uh, in the bulletin. We've got a special announcement in just a moment, but I want to just highlight just two or three things. One is uh, this Sunday is our typical uh, benevolent uh, offering. We take our regular offering and then the benevolent uh, offering usually stays here in Oceana County to help with food and uh, clothing and gas and those things. Today, the entire benevolent offering is going to go down to Lily of the Valley with the uh, mission trip that is going to be taking place uh, later this month. So just uh, let you know that. Also, uh, there is a, uh, a dinner tonight, adult dinner, 6 o'clock down in uh, Whitehall, 6 o'clock. That's a little bit of a change. Uh, if you haven't signed up, still can see me or Pete Roskam to do that. There is a church van leaving here at 515 to go down if you would like to be part of uh, part of that, but the dinner tonight is at 6 o'clock. Also, in your bulletin, at the top page, uh, top of the, the right-hand side, when you open it up, it says Temporary Solutions Committee. I want to tell you what that is real quick. Many, many Sundays, we are very, very full in our first uh, service here, and uh, deacons have put together a committee to look at some temporary solutions. What are some things outside a building that we can do to free up more space. And if you have ideas, please let any of the folks on that committee know. We're going to meet early January and talk about that. Uh, we're looking at some temporary solutions. We're also looking at some long-range things, but uh, we're specifically talking about uh, temporary things. And if you can get some ideas, we would love to hear from them, see one of those folks that are on that uh, listed out on that committee. Christy Heisinger is going to come, and Christy has a very special announcement uh, to share with us this morning. Good morning. We have two weeks left, and I'm not talking about Christmas. I'm talking about in preparation to get ready for this mission trip. And so I wanted to come and kind of remind you, we have put a list in the bulletin of some of the things we'd like to be able to take down there. If you have any of those items, you're welcome to bring them in, drop them at the church office, or get them to Pastor Brian, and he will take care of that. Um, also, I want to let you know, we talked about the benevolent offering is going to go down to Mexico. That is not covering the cost of our trip. All those of us going have paid for our own costs and have put money towards the project. But what happened is since then we have looked
projects we're going to be doing while we're down there. The first is with a pastor down there. His name is Pastor Saul, and he works in an area of Chihuahua that is really poor. Cinder block houses, dirt floors, tin roofs. And we're going to go there again, the same place, the same poor church, and we're going to bring bags of food. The last time we did that, they said it was equivalent of the widow with the oil and the flour, how it just never seemed to run out. We would like to go down there and bless them again. So all of the money is going to go strictly towards buying the food or the blankets for the, what we're going to do. It's not going to cover any of our costs for the trip. The second thing we're going to do is uh, a smaller group of us are going to leave from Lily the Valley and go to the new orphanage that they're trying to start, which is in Wachochi. And we're going to take a trip up into the mountains. It's an hour and a half drive up into the mountains to catch some people who have not been able to get there when the government has handed out blankets. And we're going to try to help them meet that need. There is a local missionary who has been working with the Taramahara Indians, and he knows their language. He has already got the Jesus film put into their language, and he wants to go and present that film, give them the gospel presentation, and in the end, we're going to hand out food and blankets. The problem is, when we started talking to him, he said, very likely we could have a thousand people come on. I'm hoping that, you know, maybe he's doubled the number, but even if we had 500 show up, we don't have enough money to buy blankets and food for 500 people. So that's what we're putting the need in front of you guys. I, I think those of us going kind of feel like, um, you know, the, the disciples with the five loaves and the two fish, and here's 5,000 people. So we're putting this in front of our church, and we're going to say, see how we can do to meet this need, and, and we know that this is what God wants us to do, so we're just praying that he will provide for that. And um, the last thing is, one of the staff that's been down there for years, her name is Brenda, she is getting married to Sergio. And so while we're down there, we'd like to bless her with a bridal shower. So if you have been down there, or even if you haven't, if you have something you could bring in for a bridal shower gift that we could take down, that would be great, because they're going to need to set up a house. And working as staff at Lily, they just don't have much money. So we'd like to be able to bring down some basic things that you would use to set up a house and, and just bless them with that shower. We, last I heard Mama's check-in, she thinks maybe $15 a blanket. We're hoping they'd be able to find them for cheaper than that. These people that live up in the mountains, their temperatures are similar to what we have here. No heat, dirt floors, and I mean, literally, there are people there who will die this year because they have no way to keep warm and no food. And so that's what we're just trying to meet that. So we're, we're trying to buy a good enough quality blanket that will keep them warm. So, okay. uh, as we take up the offering, I'd like to read a scripture that we read before we started our Praise time, our praise team time this morning that uh, Dorothy gave us. It's Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle just have so much to be thankful for, and uh, God is such a good God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all your blessings. We thank you for the truth that comes forth in your scripture that you have revealed to us, and uh, Lord, we thank you for this church, and we pray that it, it's a light on a hill, that uh, people will be drawn to your truth through the work that we do here, Father. I pray that you take our offering you would multiply it as the loaves and the fishes, as you did the loaves and the fishes, Lord, and that you would bless uh, the giving, and that you would be uh, able to do mighty works with what the little things that we give to you, compared to what you have given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. And its splendor fills up the sky. It's the same that appeared and the wise men revered when hope was born this night. Out upon the snowy fields, there's a silent peace that hears, and it echoes the grace of our Savior's embrace because hope was born on this night. Glory to God in the church choir sings with the praise the ancient of days when hope 
God gave his promise of a savior to Abraham. He made it known that all peoples would be blessed by him. The savior was not for Jews alone, but for all mankind. <clears throat> one thousand years later, God again spoke of this one. This time he chose to bless David, the man after God's own heart. David had become king over Israel, and though he had his times of failure, his greatest desire was to pursue God and to serve Him. Because of David's passion for God, the Lord reveals another part of His plan to David through Nathan the prophet. In 1 Chronicles 17, he says, Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. Now I will make your name like the names of the greatest men of the earth. When your days are over and you go to be with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom forever. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. I will never take my love away from him, as I took it away from your predecessor. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. Here are some new things made known about the promised one. He will be from David's family. He will be a king whose kingdom is eternal. As God said, his throne will be established, which means to be fixed, firm, and enduring forever. The fulfillment is found in Matthew 1.1 1, 1, and in Luke 3.31. Both of these passages are genealogies of the birth of Christ. Luke states it this way, The son of the son of Melia, the son of Menam, the son of Matassa, the son of Nathan, the son of David. What a humbling and magnificent promise for God to make to David. Not only was David raised up from being a shepherd, but he was given the throne of Israel, and God made his name great among the nations. Now God further blesses him by allowing the Savior to be part of David's family line, a king forever. So now we have a Savior for all people who will be a king, having authority over us, ruling from a firmly established throne that will last forever. The picture of our Savior is beginning to come into focus, and we anticipate what God will reveal next. Thank you, everyone. Please stand once again. Born King.
and its splendor fills up the sky. It's the same that appeared the wise men revealed when hope was born this night. Out upon the snowy field, there's a silent peace that heals, and it echoes the grace of our Savior's embrace, because hope was born this night. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth. bells ring as softly a church choir sings it's the song used to praise the ancient of days when hope was born this night angels in this place and my heart resounded the praise like a shepherd so scared i rejoice and declare that hope was born this night Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Let all of the world sing chorus of joy, because hope was born this night. Gloria, 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 Gloria. sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross, love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah. Name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, who rescued for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and poured out all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing, love so amazing. Redeemer, 
rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, all our hope is in you. song we just sang, there's a phrase in there that says, the veil was torn. The veil was torn. And uh, I'm, I'm just thinking that some of you don't know what that means. <laughs> I thought I'd just take a moment to explain that in the Old Testament, when the temple was built, there was a holy place, and then there was a most holy place, and, and there was a great uh, six-inch thick curtain that separated the holy place where the priests would go daily to perform their functions and then on the other side of that curtain was the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God was uh, was there on the uh, other side of the veil and a priest went in there one time a year to offer blood and make atonement for his people and it was, uh, I guess we could call it a limited access area of the temple and when Jesus died Gospels, it tells us that on the day he was crucified, the veil was torn. And and uh, what that, there's a symbolic uh, meaning there, and what it means is that access was given to the to the holy God, God Almighty. And and uh, we're so used to that idea today that we don't appreciate the way it used to be. And so we can come anytime into the presence of God the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and uh, he uh, opens his arms 
shift into sort of Christmas mode this morning a little bit, and it's gonna, we're sort of um, doing a chain stitch, and we're gonna grab a little bit of what we were talking about last week, and uh, a little bit of Christmas, and a little bit of communion this morning, and sort of all roll this into one big, big uh, uh, message this morning. So Christmas is uh, two weeks away. And it is our intention on Christmas Day to have a service that feels uh, a lot like celebration. And uh, I thought that if today uh, the Holy Spirit has led us to uh, do some thinking this morning about one of the things that we will have to celebrate about. And it's going to feel a little different. Like, oh my goodness, I, I didn't do a lot of thinking about that. Uh, that aspect of things that I, hasn't occurred to me to celebrate that. So at the same time, it's going to connect to last week's message. So the key verse that uh, will be on the table for us this morning is Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. And so, uh, can I have the next? There we go. So this is, this is the two verses, and I'm going to warn you that... Uh, that I have done a message on these two verses before, and uh, this is not that message. So don't say, well, I've heard that before. So here's the two verses. When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law. And then this last phrase is where we're going this morning might receive the full rights of sons. So, I have, as I mentioned, preached on this before, and what I have mentioned, what we've talked about before, was sort of emphasizing when the time had fully come, and looking sort of at the, at the setting, at the, at the, uh, the way things were, in the world when Jesus came. So we, uh, we've emphasized the fact that Greek was the common language so that when the men who uh, were his apostles wrote down their experiences and what God, that everybody could read it. The Greek was spoken all the way from India all the way to Spain. And uh, so it was, it was uh, understandable. The Romans in the days of Jesus had had made it possible to travel safely, so the so the pirate problem was uh, eliminated, to the, uh, and the brigands that would sort of lie in wait to attack people and the trade routes and everything that was dealt with, and so people could could literally expect to arrive at their destination two or three countries away when before there was you know somebody would leave home and you'd never know if you're going to see them again or not, and so there was this great peace. And there was a lot of skepticism about religion in the air when Jesus came. So the, the Roman pantheon of gods and the Greek gods before them and the, sort of the mystery religions, everybody had just about had it with all that. And they, everyone pretty much knew that that was a bunch of malarkey. And so when the truth came uh, with the Lord Jesus, people were ready to hear it. Now, all of what I've just said is true, but that's not what this verse is talking about. As I said last week, Galatians, the whole book of Galatians, was written by the Apostle Paul to some Christians who were in danger of being sucked back into living a life that was defined by the law. So someone would get saved, we'll say, and, some, and then he would say, well, how should I live my life? And someone would just hand him the Ten Commandments and say, here it is, here's how you're supposed to live. And part of that uh, was uh, circumcision and some of the other uh, ceremonial aspects of the law. And so, so today's passage pulls back from this issue a little bit so that we can get a grip on God's overall plan for his people. So I'd like us to look at chapter 3, starting in verse 19. And uh, you deacons, we, uh, we are going to do communion, and it will be about uh, five more minutes into this message, and then we'll complete the message when we're done with communion, and you'll see why in just a moment. So in verse 19, in Galatians chapter 3, 
Paul is talking about the law. And so he says here, what then was the purpose of the law? He says it was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. Now the seed, we know, he is referring to Jesus. You can go all the way back to the promise that we read about last week when God made a promise to Abraham and he said, he said uh, it is through your seed that the whole world will be blessed. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, notice that it says here, it, there's the word until in this verse. The law was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. And so there's an idea here that the law is put into place, but, but there's going to come a time when it will be laid aside. It, will be, it is put in place until... So it just sort of introduces the idea that the law is only meant to stand until Jesus came, which is really part of the whole point of the book of Galatians. The law is, you guys are not under law now, so that makes sense. You know, the Ten Commandments, let's think about this a minute. The Ten Commandments are kind of like fire. If you put fire in the Olympic torch or in one of the cylinders in your automobile, it is a very helpful thing, right? You can cook, you know, make a bonfire and cook hot dogs over the fire, and the fire has performed a useful function. However, if you put fire in the midst of a dry forest or in the corner of your attic, fire turns into a very destructive thing. The law is like that. In heaven... The Ten Commandments, the law, is an amazingly beautiful monument to the, to the character of God. There's many, many places in the Bible where the law is celebrated and held up and, and adored and, and, and so on. So that's, we understand that. But at the same time, the law can look very much like the electric chair or a hangman's noose or a sharp sword that is just about ready to, to impale you. So look at what it says here in verse 23. Skip ahead a little bit. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith shall be revealed. And so in, Paul is talking about the law here like he is a, like, a, like a bounty hunter or something, ready to drag you in and throw you into jail. So not, right there, it doesn't feel like the law is such a good thing. So this is where we get a look at God's intentions. So look at the next verse, verse 24. So the law, Paul says, was put in charge to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith. And so what, what Paul is saying here is that the law was, was sort of put into uh, the lives of people so that it would uh, push us in the direction of putting our confidence in Jesus Christ. So how does this work? So let's think about this just a moment. To anyone who will think about it, anyone who will think about it, the law says, have you told a lie? Have you told a lie? And you have to go, well, yeah, I think I have. And the law says, have you put anything ahead of God? Uh, yep, I think I have done that. Have you misused the holy name of God? I mean, think about your whole career. Taking the name of Jesus or taking the name, the holy name of God and put it together with something very unclean. Uh, I've done that. Have you rebelled against your parents? Don't even go there. And so if the answer to any of these questions, or six other questions, since they only covered four of the commandments, 
if the answer to any of these questions is yes, then you can forget about standing before God and, and saying to God, I've lived a pretty good life. I think I deserve to go to heaven. I think I've done your will, Lord. All he has to do is drag out the Ten Commandments and just check them right off. No, you haven't. So the purpose of the law, one of the purposes of the law, is to leave a man feeling guilty. It's, for all practical purposes, intended to feel like a very great weight and a burden that crushes us and leaves us uh, sprawled out before the Lord, uh, unsettled and definitely anxious about meeting God. So God doesn't want us to stay there. He's not interested in just leaving us flat and, you know, leaving us looking like a steamroller rolled over us or something. His purpose, his ultimate purpose is that we respond to that and turn to another possible answer. Hopefully we will realize our need for a Savior. Hopefully we will understand we are in need of God's mercy. And so what it says here in verse 24 is that, is that the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. It can actually lead a person to put his faith in Christ. And when he does that, Christ's perfection is credited to him by virtue of his faith uh, in what Christ has done, not in his own deeds, because the law puts to death any hope that you can stand before God on your own. So this makes sense. And so this is right where I thought it would be a good time for us to celebrate the Lord's table together, because that is what this is all about. So deacons, if you could come forward, we will do that right now. feel very much like Christmas yet, but it will. Just be patient. So if you are here this morning and you have um, given up the idea of earning 
Christmas I love we look For sinners, ransom from heaven, Jesus the Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous. And we are to understand that if, if you fail to be declared righteous, heaven will be closed to you, which is bad news. No one will be declared righteous by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. We'll talk about that. But now, a righteousness apart from law has been made known. This righteousness, Look at verse 25, Galatians chapter 3. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. So what Paul is saying here is that we are now a people who are not defined by the law. We are people who are defined by faith. And in our present situation, the law has been pushed aside. It's kind of like when you're raising kids and they get to the age where you no longer have to call the babysitter. And you, and you look at your, you know, your 12-year-old son, you say, you know what? No more babysitter. We're going, mom and I are going out. You are responsible for yourself. The babysitter is, the law is no longer 
your need and can babysit us. Now, now the next five minutes or so, I want you to put on your thinking hat because there is a revolutionary truth here that, that we're just sort of not used to thinking in these terms. Let's move ahead to chapter 4, and I want us to look at the first three verses. So these are the verses that lead up to the verses 4 and 5 that we started the, uh, the message time with. So Paul is giving us kind of an amazing metaphor, an illustration of what he's talking about. So he says, what, well let me just, uh, this, 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 these three verses are intended to get, uh, for us to get a better grip on what he has already told us. So this isn't new information, this is just so we can get a firm grasp on what it is that is going on here. So let's just say that there is a very wealthy man who owns lands and big fat bank accounts and, and he has a son and for some reason this man dies young and leaves a son that's seven, eight, nine, something something like that. He's a minor. And uh, so he is immature and so until the time that he reaches his adulthood, a guardian is a trustee is put in charge of this young fellow in all the resources that he owns. So now here's what the, the scripture says. Paul says, what I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father in the will or the trust agreement. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. And he's talking about the law here. And so this illustration in these first three verses is really about the law. And what Paul is saying, and here's, here's where it gets a little deep. What Paul is saying is that in the thousands of years of history, before Christ came, uh, so think pretty much the whole Old Testament. In all of those thousands of years, God's people, all of God's people, lived in a state of immaturity. They were like minors. And in a way, they, they, they were, were people who could not be left on their own. Just like if you're a parent of an eight-year-old and you decide to go out on a, on a mom and dad date, you have to find someone to look after Junior because he's not old enough to look after himself. He's not responsible enough. And so these people in the Old Testament who are living in their condition of immaturity, they have really uh, their hands on very little of the riches that God has for his people. And in, in their state of immaturity, the law was the babysitter. You with me so far? The law was their babysitter. And so let's, let's just continue the metaphor a little further. The law was the one that told his people to eat their peas and to brush their teeth before they go to bed and do their homework and hold their hand as they cross the street. The law did all that. It spanked them when they told a lie or hit their brother. When Jesus came, what Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 is saying is that when Jesus came, the people of God were ushered into their adulthood. And the law was said, we don't need you anymore. We don't need any more babysitters around here because this child of mine has become an adult. The son was said, uh, the parents said to the son, Son, I have fired the nanny. You are now an adult. Now go out and act like one. Now let's read these two verses again. Verses 4 and 5 of Galatians 4. When the time had fully come, God
God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. What, what the phrase, when the time had fully come, means is that it is now time for God's people to turn 21 and put their childhood behind them. They are minors no more. It is time to receive the full rights of sons. Here's the car keys. Here's the debit card that is attached to a bottomless bank account. Here's the keys to the family business. And here's the placard that you get to sti stick on your office door that says CEO. It's all yours. We fired the trustees. You know, the nanny is gone. The babysitter is out the door. You are now adults. And so what I want you to think about this morning is that Christmas, when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son. Christmas is the time that we get to remember that God, you know, in the grand flow of, of history, as God dealing with his people, Christmas is the time when God decided to relate to his children like they were responsible adults instead of kids. Well, that doesn't mean that everyone acts like a responsible adult, I hope to tell you. But it does mean that God is willing if his people are. Now this is like a revelation to me. Now here's where it's going to start sounding a little bit familiar and where it's going to tie into last week. Now you notice I've got a backpack on. I'm living out one of my fantasies. When I was a kid, my dad used to go bowling, and he would take me with him every night, probably to get me out of my mother's hair, which I didn't realize till I thought about it uh, recently. But he would go bowling, and he'd take me with him. And so I was there, you know, they bowl, I don't know how many games they bowl, but it was a typical bowling alley, and he'd give me about 35 cents to put in my pockets, and back then you could get, like, for five cents, you could put a nickel into a vending machine and pull the lever and get a five-pack, five-stick pack of Juicy Fruit gum, and a dime would get you a candy bar, and so with 35 cents, I lived it up. I know that dates me. Um, so we would, you know, every once in a while we'd go to the gas station, and just every once in a while, my dad would, would uh, pop out a dime and put it in the vending machine and pull the lever, and out would come, and my, my uh, favorite candy bar was a Snickers. And I'd get a Snickers candy bar, and I thought I was in heaven. But it would irritate me that he did this less often than I knew he could. You know, I'd, I'd hear the change jingling in his pocket. And I would, you know, I, I kind of learned after a while not to beg. But he just, like, every once in a while, but I, he could give me a candy bar whenever he wanted. And I had this fantasy that when I become an adult, I'm going to get me a backpack, and I'm going to fill it with candy bars. And I am gonna, I'm going to eat candy bars as, like, off whenever I want. I'm gonna, and I'm, I'm going to do that right now. So this, literally, this, this backpack is full of candy bars. And uh, I'm sorry, I didn't bring enough for everyone. But okay. So, you know, the thing is, <laughs> and I'm, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, or I'm starting to realize the power of money and how much money when you're an adult really goes through your fingers as a young teenager. And I thought, man, when I get to be on my own, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have like a stash of Snickers underneath my bed, a backpack full of them. I'm going to live it up. But by the time I became an adult, I knew better, except for right now. my 
fourth one. Okay. When we reach adulthood, think about this. This is a little bit of uh, stealing some thunder from the Raising Kids class, Mark, in the next hour. When we reach adulthood, we do not go from being controlled by our parents to being out of control, most of us. What really happens is that we go from living under the external rule of our parents, so they tell us when to go to bed, eat our peas, you know, what to wear, you know, the, the dad stands at the door when his daughter, you know, you're not wearing that to school, you know, all, all the kinds of things that go on between parents and kids. We go from being ruled by the external control of our parents to being ruled by the internal control of our conscience, of our of our a sense of right and wrong, our sense of responsibility, and and the in the and there's sort of a logic also in living life where we call it the golden rule, where if you will just think about how you want someone to treat you, think about it, and then treat them that way. That's pure logic. You don't even need to be a Christian to figure. That out. And just just those kinds of ideas will help you to understand how to live life. And so now your parents aren't telling you how to live and what to do and how to spend your money and how many candy bars you can have in a given period of time. But hopefully the the sense of knowing how to live comes from within you. It's it's not of going from control your the control by your parents to no control. It's going from the control of your parents to the internal rule of these things which I've just mentioned. So it works the same way in the spiritual realm is what we're saying this morning. Christ brought with him. So here's the baby in the manger. He brought with him a plan for a new age of spiritual adulthood for the people of God where the external rule of the law would be removed. And we would move into a time when there was the internal rule of the Holy Spirit. That is why it says in verse 6 of chapter 4, look at this now. This is just just leaves my with the uh, take my breath away because you are sons so these are these are fully mature adult sons now because you are adult sons paul says god sent the spirit of his son into our hearts and it is the spirit who calls out abba father christmas means then that god finally decided to fire the babysitter and treat us like sons and heirs, not slaves who need to be told what to do all the time. We now have the Holy Spirit so we will know the truth. We have the Holy Spirit so that we can think like God when it comes to the endless gray areas and the complicated issues that morality brings on. And so let's, let's take the illustration of a candy bar, since that's where we've uh, camped out for a moment. The law says, thou shalt have one candy bar a week. And that's probably more than what I got when I was eight years old. Thou shalt have one candy bar a week. But then the Holy Spirit model comes in. And what we begin to figure out is that the issues that are in play when it comes to how many candy bars should I have? Should I really? It cost me $8, by the way, to fill up my backpack full of candy bars at uh, Walmart yesterday. And uh, so I, I honestly could have spent $80. And if I'd have stretched it a little bit, I could have spent $800. And like we 
wheelbarrow full of candy bars. But there's there's some issues that come into play here that that the Holy Spirit would lead us to think about. So this is just just an illustration because there's so many things like this that we have to figure out when we move through life. Candy bars are just like hardly scratching the surface. How about calories? I noticed on one of the bigger ones, it's 240 calories. Okay, well, I'm an adult. I need to kind of figure out what's appropriate for me to consume in a 24-hour period. How about exercise? I think I would, honestly, if I had gone out for a, uh, a long run of a couple miles, which that is not me, but if I had done, I'd feel a little more comfortable eating a candy bar at the end of 45 minutes or an hour of exercise than if I had no exercise. How about stewardship? I did a little back-of-the-envelope calculations, and I figured out that two candy bars a day, and I know where I can get a decent-sized Snickers for 75 cents, so that's a buck and a half a day times 30, is, uh, is a lot. It's a lot of money. You know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of wondering if, if uh, the reason God put sixty dollars into my hands was so that I could make a fool of myself with candy bars in a month's time. So there's kind of a stewardship. It's only seventy-five cents. You start doing that twice a day, every day of the of the month, and it's a lot of money. There's some value in self-denial. There's some value in saying no to the impulse to, hey, you've got time, go down and get a candy bar. Or open up your backpack and grab a quick one. There's some value in not allowing my stomach to be my God. There are some concerns about tooth decay that a thinking person uh, should have some thoughts about that. I can guarantee you two candy bars a day every day of the month going to be seeing your dentist a little more often than you would have before. Maybe you're different than I, but I'd like to save something in my life for a special treat. There's some value in saving candy for a kind of a special occasion. And maybe uh, more to the point, I was, I was uh, reading an article about, uh, about cancer the other day, and uh, you know the person that wrote the article said, people need to eat more more fruit. Eat an apple. Like maybe if I have a sweet tooth, and I promise you I do, that maybe the better thing for me to do is grab a bunch of grapes or have a banana or a piece of apples instead of grab another Snickers. It'd just be overall healthy for me to do that. Now I don't really, I told Dorothy I was going to do this, she says you're going to just make everybody feel guilty every time they have a candy bar. And I am going to have a candy bar every once in a while, and maybe I should make myself accountable to you to you and tell you how long it takes me to go through all these candy bars in my backpack. And so there's nothing wrong with a candy bar once in a while, but there's a, just, there's a whole lot more issues in play than just, thou shalt have one candy bar a week. And so who who is it that's going to lead us through all these complicated issues and things that a, a wise person would think about? And the answer is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that God gives to us in our adulthood. And he says, you are a responsible person. I believe in you. I'm going to, I'm not, I'm no longer going to sort of tell you how to live. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and he will tell you from the inside out how he wants you to live. It's a great privilege like an adult by the Lord. Now I'd like us to finish up by going back to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. There's three verses I want us to look at here. and his desire to give good gifts. So he says in verse 11, 
Luke 11, 11. Hey, you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, are you going to give him a snake? Probably not. If he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If you then, all you dads, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven, so he's, he's about ready to say that if, if a human dad knows how to sort of provide for the needs, sort of out of this desire to um, protect and care for his son and be a good dad and everything, then our Father in Heaven, he's a really good dad. He really knows how to give to us, his sons, the things that we need to thrive. But look what he says, what he gives. It's not our daily bread, it's the Holy Spirit. How much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So what we learn here is that the ultimate expression of the generosity and the goodness of God is that he gives us the Holy Spirit. We know from Galatians, at the same time, he removes the law. He fires the babysitter, and he gives us the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at this, and I'm just saying, what a joy to be endowed with this amazing gift. What a privilege to, to move from being treated like a slave who has to be told every minute what to do to be treated like a son, who's a, like a co-owner of the, of the estate, where the dad says, son, I'm leaving for a month. You take charge. You know what to do. Out the door he goes. I feel inspired and empowered and and privileged to be treated like a like an adult by the Lord, if I can say it like that. But I also understand that in the end, I'm not on my own, because the Holy Spirit is given to me so that I know what to do. That apart from the Holy Spirit, I will fail. So if this is true, If this is true, then the age in which we live is is uh, significantly different than than the Old Testament, and it isn't just about the cross and the way that our salvation has been purchased. It has to do with how we live and how we make choices. So, if this is true, then one of the greatest things that a father can do is to live his life in a way where he is obviously under the direction of the Holy Spirit and for that dad to teach his children how to live this way. This is what Christian maturity looks like. It's not somebody that never misses church. It's not necessarily someone that, you know, is faithful in his giving. It's not necessarily someone that, uh, you know, no longer cusses. It's someone who lives like an adult. Someone who, who uh, looks, has learned to look to the Holy Spirit for, for the, the choices that he makes in life. And let me also say that one of the greatest things that a church elder can do is to live the life of a man who recognizes the voice of the Holy Spirit of God and leads others to do the same. So this Christmas time, take time to thank God for the freedom that he has entrusted us with. And it's, it's the kind of freedom that you get when you become an adult and you leave home and you're entrusted with the privilege and the responsibility to, to, to uh, no longer live like a child.
this Christmas, that's what Christmas is going to look like for me. And I, and I uh, encourage you to do more thinking about this and read over Galatians 4 and ask yourself the question, um, now that I'm an adult, how do I live my life differently than when I was a child? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the faith that you put in us. We pray, God, that we would live uh, in such a way so that we have confidence in us.